Goshnar presents. It is no secret that humans are curious beings by nature. Even Banor, virtuous as he was, could not always resist that nature. When he commanded that the city be founded right in this location, he might have been guided not by the favorable conditions alone, but also by his curiosity towards these ancient structures. And surely, it was that curiosity that had come to the fore when he ordered his people to build long-distance ships adapted to sailing uncharted waters for many cycles. He knew that Kalabal had been bestowed upon us so that we may live and prosper in peace far from perils of the outside world. Nonetheless, he was still very curious about that world. That is why, as soon as the ships were ready, Banor dispatched his most trusted men to sail into the unknown and discover other lands that the gods had created. And may they grant the crew their grace, so that the path ahead be bright and clear. The sentries continued to gaze at the endless ocean looking for any signs of our returning ships. One morning a sentry observed tiny dark shapes on the horizon. They were no product of his exhausted mind nor a trick of light after an overnight watch. And yet, the people's initial joy quickly gave way to fear. The guard stationed on the highest tower was the first one to notice that the incoming ships had not been built in our shipyard. They were warships manned by ugly creatures, green of skin, armed and ready to fight. Banner forthwith gave an order to close the gates and prepare to defend the city. Bloody fights continued till the next morning. The war horns sounded, accompanied by the first rays of the suns, and the green creatures began to retreat. Suddenly, there was silence, broken only by the occasional groan of a wounded soldier. This was the first time that the city walls served their purpose on such a scale. Banor, however, standing by the gate, considering the bodies of the fallen soldiers, could think of but one thing, the wrath of the gods that he had drawn upon the city by his unrestrained curiosity. New households continued to settle down in the vicinity of the lighthouse. A few merchants decided to build stone houses there and, together with their families, they moved in to be able to personally see to the exchange of goods. Also, a few wooden huts were set up for the fishermen. The fisheries there had not been as heavily exploited as those around the city, and the fish could be picked up right away by the caravans, which were running more frequently in that time. Even though many people remained skeptical, it seemed that the route was thoroughly safe, as the unearthly creatures in the mountains had assured. There was still a risk, though, that the orcs would return, and the vulnerable and defenseless village would be an easy target in case of another attack. The sailors who traveled to the other continent claimed that neither Orcs warships nor scout ships had been seen for a long time. Nonetheless, they also brought dreadful stories of the Orcs' conquests on the land. Thus, Banner, even though he had consented to leaving the city and settling the area around the lighthouse, was still very much concerned. He fretted that he would be unable to ensure the safety of all his people, considering this level of dispersal. He also knew that things had changed since the first ship had returned from the other continent, carrying the news of the establishment of a new settlement. Nothing was as it used to. The consequences of his decision to organize that disastrous expedition could not have been undone. Great changes were already in motion. Many people began experiencing unusual dreams. Interestingly, the majority of them were merchants and travel guides, 
which led some people to explain this phenomenon with travel-related anxiety that might have been caused by those preposterous rumors I mentioned before. Others attempted to associate this with the arrival of the final group of settlers from the continent to the factory. There was, however, nothing that could corroborate this particular theory. There were also those who would recall the story of the seamstress, who, having been deemed deranged, had died in the hospital with symptoms of poisoning. After all, conspiracy theories always find eager supporters. In the meantime, the preparations for the fourth banana fete continued according to plans. That year's festivities were to be adorned by a fire theater, followed by an event of wine tasting, whereof the highlight would be the banana wine from the previous year. At last, Mala prepared for a decisive strike. He sent a messenger to Gable and challenged him to a personal duel. Gable, who was prepared to do anything to stop the fratricidal war, accepted the challenge. The enemies agreed to meet in the fertile plains of Kalabal. There they stood, face to face, the old king and the usurper, and so did their armies, because neither of two was gullible or foolish enough to come on his own. It was the greatest gathering of jinns in recorded history. Eventually, Gabal stepped forward to meet his opponent. This was the moment Mala, who had never intended to fight honorably, had been waiting for. All of a sudden, the earth opened in a thousand places, and hordes of vicious undead attacked the Gable and his army. For Mala had secretly formed an alliance with the dreaded necromancers of Drefia, and it was them who controlled the undead hordes that fought for him. Faced with an overwhelming enemy, Gabel and his army turned to flee. A number of married was caught and slaughtered on the spot, but much to Mala's disappointment, the majority of Gable's troops managed to escape southwards in what appeared to be a well-planned strategic withdrawal. And how much greater was his surprise to find that the married fled to the city of Ankramun, where they appeared were expected. It was then that he realized that Gabel had suspected a ruse all along and that he had prepared a counter-strategy. Mailer immediately ordered his troops to abandon pursuit, but it was too late. The undead marched against Ankramun with all the determination of a mindless killing machine, and the Afrit, blinded by rage, did not lag behind, only to be met by ceaseless barrages of arrows and catapult stones. A cataclysmic battle ensued. Wave after wave of undead and Efreet stormed against Ankramun, and wave after wave broke at the huge fortifications of the city. Both the married and the humans were well prepared for this battle, and even though Mala's army wreaked havoc, they never yielded. At last, even Bar Leal, who led the Efreet in battle, had to admit that the married and their despised human allies fought valiantly. However, despite the heavy losses, he was determined to decide the war there and now. He summoned the most powerful Efreet wizards and ordered them to unleash a huge column of magic fire onto Ankraman in order to render the city and all those in it to cinders. The Efreet wizards followed his orders and soon a wall of devastating fire rose up to the sky. However, when they tried to move it, they realized that they had lost control over it. The Marid had soon seen through Balil's plan, and Faradin and his fellow Marid Megas used their own magic to turn the devastating flames against their creators. A fierce battle of wills ensued between the mages from both sides, and the whole battle came to a halt when the two armies watched in horrified fascination as the terrible pile of flames wandered seemingly undecided. But then, all of a sudden, the fire began to burn higher and spread in all directions. And within seconds, those who had summoned it from the sky were reduced to smoldering ashes and the flames engulfed the entire city of Ankrahmun. That was the turning point of the great battle. Thanks for watching. 
Don't forget to like and subscribe.